It was great to have Allie Goble leading worship with us this morning. She's on loan from our Mill Creek campus, so thank you so much, Allie, for being here today. And for having Gretchen Gilbert share church family news with us today. Gretchen helps lead our student ministries, and we are blessed as a church family to have young leaders like this on our ministry team. Well, I would guess, like most of you, um, or you would agree with me, that I, I really hate car problems. I mean, anybody here enjoy having car problems? I mean, like, you know, the check engine light goes on, yeah, bring it on. Scraping brakes, yeah, give me some of those. Transmission falls out, yeah, I'll take some more of that. Said no one ever. Well, many years ago, uh, when we, I looked forward in our family life uh, that one day we would have six drivers in our family, myself, my wife, and our four sons, I decided to pursue a strategy of car buying that would not include car payments anymore. Just couldn't afford it, so we bought all used cars. So for years, we've had a fleet of used vehicles, very used vehicles. Uh, most recently, we had five. I own five vehicles with a, combina- with a total um, mileage of over a million miles. And I've learned, no, that's, that's true, literally over a million miles. Uh, and I've learned over those years that having used cars might be more economical on one end, but eventually you're going to have issues. So at my wife's urging, we eventually became members of AAA so that when the inevitable problem happened, we would have coverage and they would come help us with roadside assistance or towing or whatever we needed. And we've used AAA a lot over the last few years. Turn, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, one of our boys was driving home uh, from out of state, and about, I got a call about, on my cell phone about 1.30 in the morning. He was broken down on the side of I-88 about 20 minutes from home. So uh, I said, what's happened? He said, well, it's a uh, car smoking like crazy, there's steam coming out, and there's all kinds of fluid leaking out of the bottom of the engine. Now, I'm not a mechanic, but I thought that sounded like uh, bad news. So I drove out, picked him up, Brought him home, and I left a, a, a handwritten sign taped to the window of the car. It's the middle of the night. It's like 2.30 in the morning. You know, we're going to ha- have this car towed by AAA first thing in the morning. Uh, so my son got up early, drove out to that spot, called tri- uh, was going to call AAA, but wait for them right there, but the car wasn't there. The police had had it towed in the middle of the night. Must have created some hazard, and they towed it to an impound yard. So we had to call AAA. They went to the impound yard, towed it to our mechanic, who found out it was a catastrophic failure, could not be repaired. We had to junk the car. But the point of the story is we had coverage. We had AAA just in that, for that very, uh, that very purpose. So we're in a series today called Songs of the Soul. We're in our ninth week. We have one more week to go. We've been walking our way through this beautiful book in our Old Testament called Psalms. Uh, Now, many scholars uh, believe that Psalm 91 that we're going to look at today is the second most favorite psalm of all time. Of all 150, it's the second most favorite. The most favorite is Psalm 23. It's the one most people know, the Lord is my shepherd. But this comes right behind it because it's a very beautiful psalm. It's one of the most comforting psalms in all the Bible. And yet, we're going to find that in this psalm, there are some things that that are just hard to understand. And we have to wrestle with them today. So let me begin it for you, and then we'll, break, uh, we'll stop and break it down as we move through today's message. Psalm 91, beginning in verse 1. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. Now, I'm going to pause there. Uh, we're going to talk about three things this morning in this psalm. First, a promise, and then a problem, and then a fulfillment. So first, the promise, the promise of protection. Now, Psalm 91, you may know, is often called the soldier's psalm or the trench psalm, because all the way back in World War I, soldiers would often recite this psalm every day before heading out into battle. And they would put it on cards and put it into their, into their uniform somewhere uh, for protection um, and for good reason. Even now, uh, most recently, soldiers are given bandanas, camouflage bandanas with this psalm printed on that bandana. They'd wear it on their heads underneath their helmets as they've gone into battle in the Middle East, different places. Again, for good reason, which we're going to see in just a moment. But the first thing we notice about this psalm is that in the first two verses, the writer uses four names for God. I put them in red. I'm going to go through them so you can see them. He says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. 
Now, that Hebrew word is Elion. It refers to the supreme God, the God who's above all gods, God who is greater than all the gods of all the surrounding pagan people groups. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. This is a different Hebrew word, El Shaddai. It also re refers to a God who is all-powerful, but specifically one who is able to keep his promises. Keeps going. Will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, now this is a different Hebrew word. You've learned through this series that whenever you see that word in all caps in your Bible, it's translating the, the Hebrew word Yahweh, which is the ancient holy name, the personal name of God. I am that I am, sometimes translated Jehovah, and that's the name God gave to Moses way back in the Old Testament. My refuge and my fortress, my God, here's the fourth word, Elohim, which means the creator of all things in whom I trust. So some of this is poetic repetition. The psalm writer saying the same thing in different ways, which you see other times in the psalms. But there's also something else I think we can pull out of here that's very beautiful. The psalm writer, I think, right off the bat is recognizing that the God who is supreme in authority and power, the God who is above all things, the God who created the entire universe by speaking his word, this God can also be known. He's given us his personal name. He's the God who is near and lives in relationship with us. We'll come back to that later in the psalm. And then we see a whole series of images, images that convey protection. God is our shelter. That means a secret place. Uh, the shadow of the Almighty, that literally means shade. These were people who lived in the Middle East, and a tree or a covering would shade them from the hot sun, offer protection. Refuge means a place you run to in, in the midst of a storm or gale. Fortress is even more dramatic in its safety and protection. Then shield and buckler are military references. That's what a soldier would carry in the battle. A shield was a larger shield. The buckler was a small handheld shield. And then we see an image that's a bit surprising to us. In verse 3, Psalm says, For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. Now, what's that talking about? Fowler is not a word we use much in English anymore, but it means a hunter. And a, a snare is a trap that the hunter uses to catch prey. And from the deadly pestilence, pestilence is a kind of a Bible-sounding word, it means an overwhelming disease or a plague that ravages, is a symbol for evil in the world. He will cover you with his pinions. I'm sure some of you are like, what's a pinion exactly? Well, that's a kind of sort of an old-fashioned word for feathers. And under his wings, you will find refuge. So the image here is of a mother bird who's protecting her chicks under her wings. So you put all these images together, and we see the God of strength and might, who's like a warrior in battle, a fortress, but also the God of tenderness and comfort and care, like a, like a mother eagle or a mother hen. And then there are also three words that point to how we know and experience this protection. The psalm writer says, he who dwells in, that means to remain with, uh, will abide in, that word means to lodge or to literally stay the night with, in whom I trust. That's in whom I place my, my confidence and my faith. These are all words that point to faith and an intimate relationship, and we're going to come back to those a bit later. So the promise is, right here at the beginning, that God promises to protect, to deliver, to cover all those who dwell in, abide in, and trust in him. Beautiful and comforting words. And yet now comes the problem. Because the second part of the psalm, I think, presents a problem of perspective. Problem of perspective. I'm sure most of you have seen those images. That The first time you see them, they look like one thing. And then the longer you look at them, they look like another thing. Okay, take a look at this one. How many of you see a duck? How many of you see a bunny rabbit? Hmm? Uh -huh. First time I saw that, I, I, all, all I could see was the duck. I knew it was supposed to be two things, but I kept looking and looking. I had, finally had to like, Google search what else is in there, and I found the rabbit. How to, let's check, check out this one. How many see an old woman with a big nose? Really? Nobody saw that. That's what I see right off the bat. How many see a young woman looking the other way? Yeah, interesting. It all depends on perspective, how you look at something. And I think Psalm 91 leads us into a problem of perspective. Let me try to explain. Years ago, 
uh, a, a new family began attending Chapel Street. Then it was called First Baptist Geneva. And um, they had a 20-something-year-old son who uh, began experiencing a very challenging and scary issue in his life. Um, eventually, he was diagnosed with something called bipolar depression, which if you know anything about it, it's a very, very difficult, terrifying, scary thing. His parents did, his, did their best to get him into treatment. They, they prayed for him. They had lots of people uh, in groups of the church praying for him, and yet he continued to struggle. He would go on and off his medication, and when he was off, he would uh, disappear, and sometimes for months at a time, police would find him in a state thousands of miles away, just uh, wandering on the side of the road, disoriented. It was a terrifying time for these parents. Um, this went on for maybe a year or so, maybe longer, and one day, the, the young man's father came to my office at, at South Street Campus. He walked into my office. He was carrying his Bible. He walked up to my desk, and he dropped his Bible on my desk, and he said, I'm done, Pastor. I'm done. We talked, and what he was saying was, we've prayed. I've prayed and prayed and prayed for my son, and God has not kept him safe. God has not come through for me. I'm done. Now, the end of that story, as I recall, was a, was a good one. There was a redemptive ending to that story, but... Uh, in the middle of the story, it was not good. And the dad was, was, was very bitter and broken. We pick the, story, we pick the psalm up in verse 5. We read, You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Let me pause there. Just a word, short word about angels. I don't want to take a lot of time on this. But angels do appear in the Bible. Angels are mysterious beings that occur in many different places. Uh, the Bible tells us that angels are, are created supernatural beings that exist to do God's bidding. They're his messengers, and you see that often in Scripture. Um, now, point of clarity here, I hear this often, it's a, it's a, and I just want to make it clear that angels are not people who have died and gone to heaven, okay? Uh, different thing. Uh, angels are a completely different thing, so uh, it just bugs me when I hear people say that, so let's get that clear. Um, but the, how about a question? What does the Bible say about guardian angels? Is this a teaching about, do we each have a guardian angel? Well, the Bible nowhere teaches that clearly, uh, but it does indicate that, that angels interact with people sometimes. Sometimes the people know they are, sometimes they don't know they are. But we really can't know much about angelic activity because it's supernatural. Someday we might know, but now we really can't know. But what we do know a lot more about, because the New Testament tells us about it, is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's how the Lord communicates with us and leads us through His Holy Spirit uh, so we should pay a lot more attention to that than we do to angels. So continuing this, uh, the, the psalm in verse 12, on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You might recognize this. Satan used it against Jesus in the wilderness. We'll talk about that in a minute. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample underfoot. So God promises protection. And because God protects, the psalm says, you will not fear you will not fear the terror of night, the arrow that flies by day, the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, the destruction that wastes at noonday. Now, this cluster of images points to both literal danger, enemy attack, which was real in those days, uh, arrows on the battlefield, real arrows that could pierce, the threat of disease and plague, also figuratively pointing to any kind of evil that threatens. It sounds like 24-hour, all-comprehensive protection. It's sort of like a divine version of AAA or LifeLock or something like that. But then there's more. Verse 7. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Now, it's easy to see why this is a soldier's song, right? It's easy to see why you'd wear this on a bandana. Verse 9, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Now, if you're like me, or if you're thinking and following along today, 
you have a mixed reaction maybe to these words. On the one hand, they're beautiful, hopeful, comforting, but there's also a problem, isn't there? The problem is of our experience. We have a problem in our experience. Now, the week goes by, hardly, for me or Pastor Jeff or Pastor Sterling or any of us. Now, the week goes by that we don't hear a story that seems to contradict this psalm. Like the man who walked in my office and dropped his Bible on my desk. And my guess is that in a room like this, almost all of you have had a personal experience of pain, loss, disease, that seems to contradict this psalm. When it seems like plague has found your tent, or the arrow of the enemy has found this mark, what then? Is God being unfaithful to this promise? Is he forgetting his promise? Or are you doing something wrong in your faith and what you believe? And that leads to the second problem, which I'm calling a problem of interpretation. Problem of interpretation. Because at first glance, the psalm seems to be saying, if you put your faith in God, then nothing bad can ever happen to you. Guaranteed. In my study this week, I actually stumbled across a pastor who was watching a video, giving a sermon to his church online, and this is what he actually literally said to his congregation. He, ta- he, he had little cards made up with this psalm printed on them, laminated them, gave them to everybody saying, put this in your wallet, put it in your purse, and carry it with you so that evil cannot ever touch you like a rabbit's foot like a good luck charm. And I thought to myself, is that what the psalm is really saying? Because if that's what it means, then anyone who suffers anything must not really have faith. Now, here's the basic rule of thumb with regard to the Bible. We interpret any one part of the Bible in light of the rest of what the Bible has to say. So whenever you come across a single passage, it makes you go, hmm, Look at what the rest of the Bible teaches to help you understand that passage. So when we look at the rest of Scripture, what do we find? Now stick with me here just a little bit. Let's go to the book of Job, for example. Remember his story? Job was a good and righteous man who lived lived through an unimaginable season of suffering in his life. And he suffered because, if you read the story, Satan had challenged God saying, you take away Job's wealth, you take away his health, you let me take away his family, and he will curse you to your face. In other words, he only worships you, God, because you pay him to. So God allows Satan limited authority to cause suffering in Job's life, and he does. But Job continues to honor and worship God. And then Job's friend shows up, and they first show up, they show him compassion. They see his suffering is great, but then they start trying to figure out why he's suffering, and they just are convinced it must be because he has some sort of secret sin in his life and God is punishing him. Because their assumption is that God always rewards the, the righteous and always punishes the wicked. Sort of quid pro quo. But this is not actually biblical faith. That's actually a little more like the, the Eastern concept of karma. God eventually confronts these friends in Job chapter 42 and says, my anger burns against you Because you have not spoken of me what is right. Now, what if we look at the Apostle Paul in the New Testament? If Psalm 91 promises that nothing bad or painful can ever happen to you if your faith is in God, was that true in Paul's life? Listen to how Paul describes his own life, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. The reason they gave 39 lashes to a man was they believed 40 would kill him. Five times I was within an inch of my life. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and day in the open sea. I've labored and toiled and often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and I've gone without food. I've been cold and naked. So had Paul done something wrong in his faith? Or had God just forgotten the promises of Psalm 91? No, neither. Listen to Paul's perspective that he gives us in chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians. He writes, so we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light momentary affliction. Five times, 39 lashes. Light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Hear the shift in perspective? As we look not to the things that we are seen, but to things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. He takes a different 
perspective. Or what if you look at Jesus himself? We're going to celebrate Easter in about a month. And as we celebrate Easter, we're going to go back through the story and we'll be reminded that Jesus himself was not protected from suffering, pain, and evil, not in his earthly life. He was not protected from betrayal, from flogging, from beatings, from crucifixion. Had God forgotten Psalm 91? Or Matthew 4, we see the story of Satan's temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. Let me read this to you from uh, Matthew. Then the devil took him, Jesus, to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Satan is actually quoting from Psalm 91. What he does here is very subtle because he quotes it and then he twists the meaning of the promise in two ways. First, he, Satan limits the perspective of this promise to this life, to physical suffering. He says to Jesus, if you believe in God the Father, and if God the Father is who you think he is, you won't even stub your toe. By the way, this is still the number one reason in our culture, why people reject faith in God. I cannot believe in a God who allows suffering. How many times have you heard that? That's what Satan is telling Jesus. If you stub your toe, then he must not be who you think he is. Secondly, Satan distorts this promise by making physical protection the litmus test for God's goodness and love. A pastor named J.D. Greer writes, Here's a good rule for interpreting the Bible. If you come to the same theological conclusion as Satan, you're probably not reading it right. Okay? <laughs> now, can and does God protect? Yes. Does he protect from disease? Can he protect from calamity? Right here, right now? Yes. We'll never know until heaven how often he has protected us. We can't know that. But our physical safety and our health now are not the main point of the story. Listen to Paul in Romans chapter 8. He writes, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. See the perspective shift? For the creation waits for the e with eager longing for the revelation, for the re revealing of the sons of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Everything is fallen. Everything is broken. Everything needs to be redeemed. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons for the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. And then this verse, verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, Paul can say this because his perspective is not limited to physical safety. His perspective is not limited to this earthly life. He has an eternal perspective. He sees things in a different way. And it's in this perspective that we understand the promises of Psalm 91. They tell us nothing can happen to you Nothing can happen to me as a person of faith that God does not already know. Nothing can happen to you that God has not chosen to allow. And nothing can happen to you that God cannot and will not use for your good and his glory. That's the promise of Psalm 91. Jesus summarizes this perspective himself in John 16 when he says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And that leads us to the third part of the psalm, the promise fulfilled. The promise fulfilled. Verse 14, because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. And when he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now notice a couple things here. Notice the change in voice. This is now God speaking, no longer the psalm writer speaking. 
This is God's voice. Next, notice the change in perspective. Listen to all the I will statements. I will deliver. I will protect. I will answer. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue. I will satisfy. I will show him my salvation. These are all pointing toward a future fulfillment, a future deliverance. Now, who is him? To whom does God make these promises? To the one who holds fast to me in love, to the one who knows my name, he says. So the promise is protection, the perspective is eternal, and the promise is for those who by faith dwell in, abide with, and live in relationship with God. And all this is fulfilled in and through Jesus, who, in Luke chapter 13, is looking out over the great city, the holy city of Jerusalem. Shortly before his death and resurrection, here's what he says. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And I think he could be saying, Geneva, Geneva. St. Charles, St. Charles. Batavia, USA. Chapel Street. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed, listen, to gather your children together as hens, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Psalm 91, there's the promise, and you were not willing. The fulfillment of Psalm 91 is seen in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Through the cross, Jesus provides the ultimate protection and deliverance. Through the cross, Jesus shields us from the only disease that can truly kill us. And that's a disease called sin. Through his resurrection from the dead, we have victory over our greatest enemy, our final enemy, the Bible says, which is death itself. So the perspective, this perspective then redefines how we see and understand God's promise of protection. I saw this this week. One writer says, in heaven, no one will have any questions about Psalm 91. And that's true. Long ago, when one of our boys was only about four years old, I think we had three sons at the time. Our youngest was four, we are, uh, uh, almost four. Our second son was about four. Um, and our youngest had not been born yet. But we took a, like a two-week family trip to Southeast Asia, to Malaysia, where my wife spent most of her growing up years, just to see where she grew up. And while we were there, uh, this one son, who was about four, um, developed sort of flu-like symptoms for a couple of days, didn't feel very well, um, got sick to the stomach, nauseous and stuff. But then he kind of recovered. So we thought it was just travel and strange food, maybe a little bug. Got home, and a couple of weeks after we got home, he developed this weird rash on the palms of his hands and the bottoms of his feet. Really weird. We'd never seen it before. Um, and so we took him to a pediatrician. He had never seen it before. He sent us to a major hospital in Chicago with a, with a specialist in pediatric uh, infectious diseases in different parts of the world. And because the symptoms rep, 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 were similar to symptoms that, uh, that point to a, a disease that, event, that can affect the heart. And if it does... It can be major health issues for that child. So we were, we were concerned, obviously. And the doctor said, the only way we can check for this is a blood test. So I was sitting there with my son on my lap, and I was expecting, I said, sure, a blood test. So I was expecting a little pinprick or something. A nurse comes walking out of the back room with a, a giant syringe. I mean, I mean, it looked like it was that big, a giant needle and a big, like, two-gallon reservoir, at least it looked like to me. And it was scary to me let alone my four-year-old son. So as she's walking out toward us, he starts to grab onto me, and she says in this really sweet voice, uh, Mr. Coffee, would you like to hold him or would you like me to have him restrained? <laughs> she's being really nice, but I was like, uh, I'll, I'll hold him, okay? And as she got closer, she took his arm, had this big needle, and he, he looked up at me and grabbed it onto me, and with his big eyes filling with tears, he said, Daddy... Why are you letting her do this to me? If you're a parent, you know, your heart just breaks. Your heart just breaks. I knew things he didn't know. I had a perspective he didn't have. How can I begin to explain to him that it was because I loved him that I had to let this happen? How could I explain to him that if I could just give my blood for his, I would have done it a thousand times over. But I couldn't explain in that moment. I just said, hang on, buddy. I got you. I got you. It'll be okay. And it was, and it turned out to be nothing, just a virus or something. 
But a few months later, maybe a year later, it dawned on me, I had learned something in that moment. I learned something about the love of God. Because I learned that as I was holding my son, just assuring him that I was going to hold on, that it was going to be okay, that's how God was holding me at the same time. And that's the promise of Psalm 91. Because he who holds fast to me in love, I will deliver. I will protect him because he knows my name. That's the promise. Would you bow with me as I close this morning? Lord, we thank you for your word today, for this beautiful promise of protection, beautiful ancient words that people have clung to for centuries. And we know the world can be a scary place. We know that in these days, right now, we know we face times of pain and loss and fear and struggle. But help us to see with your perspective. Help us to trust your sovereign care, your eternal promise. Help us to be among those who know you by name. Pray these things in Jesus' name.